Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today to learn about CURES and the importance of getting registered. This is Courtney with CDA, and in the next hour, experts Emer McKenna and Austin Weaver from the Department of Justice will walk you all through the CURES registration process. At this time, we'll turn it over to them. Hi, this is Austin Weaver. So CURES 2.0 is California's prescription drug, mon drug monitoring program, and it's administered by the California Department of Justice. CURES stores and reports schedules two through four prescription dispensation data reported by dispensers to the Department of Justice. And the data is exactly as it's reported to us. The department does not add, modify, delete prescription data reported to CURES, and that's for data integrity purposes. Pharmacies and direct dispensers that send the data to us own those records. We're simply the custodian for the aggregated prescription records. The Department of Justice can't validate the accuracy or the truthfulness of the data. Again, the data is as reported to the department. We can verify that it is what was reported to us, but not that the underlying data that was reported to us is accurate. And pharmacies and direct dispensers are required to report dispensations at least weekly. And we receive about 1 million prescription reports per week. And we keep CURES prescription data for seven years and de-identified data indefinitely. The mission of the CURES program is set forth in California Health and Safety Code Section 11165, Subdivision A. And it's this, the department shall maintain CURES to assist healthcare practitioners in their efforts to ensure appropriate prescribing, ordering, administering, furnishing, and dispensing of controlled substances, to assist law enforcement and regulatory agencies in their efforts to control the diversion and resultant abuse of Schedule two through four controlled substances, and for statistical analysis, education, and research. The newly re released and updated CURES system, CURES 2.0, was released on January 8th of this year. And CURES 2.0 provides vastly improved user interface with, with more intuitive navigation and ease of use. It, it can be accessed with contemporary browsers that's required to have contemporary browsers for security purposes, and those are Internet Explorer version 11 or later, Mozilla Firefox, Google Chrome, and Safari. And for the time being, CURES 1.0 is concurrently being run. If you have a, an older browser, uh, one, of, one that's not listed here, let's say Internet Explorer 10, the system will automatically route you to CURES 1.0. If you want to be using CURES 2.0, then make sure to use one of those uh, compliant web browsers. At this point, I'm going to turn the, the discussion over to Imra McKenna, who's going to discuss CURES 2.0 registration process. Hi, everyone. Okay, so we're going to walk through the registration process, and um, Austin just mentioned the browser, compliant browser that you need for um, accessing Cures 2.0. When you're actually registering, going through the registration process, you'll also want to have access to a compliant browser in order to um, sign up for Cures, for your Cures account. Okay, so the next uh, few slides are going to walk you through the registration process. There are several steps involved, and there'll be um, back and forth between the web interface and your email. So whenever you're registering, you'll want to pick a valid email address that you'll use um, for your correspondence with Cures 2.0 system. So when you're ready to begin the registration process, you will navigate to the CURES homepage, which can, be, which can be found on the Office of the Attorney General's website. And the URL is on this uh, screen. You can see oag.ca.gov slash CURES. That's the CURES homepage. On the right-hand side, there's a section that um, has a number of links one of which is the CURES 2.0 registration link. So you click that link and it will bring you to the first stop, the first part of the registration process. So the first part of the process is that verifying your email address. So you will be presented with um, a screen that asks you to enter your email address and confirm it. Um, with all of the screens, within the CURES 2.0 system and the registration process, you will see a section at the top of the screen that provides 
application instructions. So basically this is instructions on the information that the system is requesting for you from that page that you're on. So um, the application instructions on the very first screen um, basically tells you that you need to enter a valid email address. Now the very first box that you have um, field available to you in the applic applicant's email confirmation section of the page is to select your user role. So you can select whether you're a prescriber or a dispenser. Then you will select where your license is issued. And for the majority of people, it will be California Department of Consumer Affairs. Um, if you're out of state of California, you will select the other options. So the, the first button will be the, the option that you'll want to pick. Then you will enter an email address. Once again, this email address will be used to, for um, communication with the system. So if you're getting your username or your password sent to you, it will be sent to the email address that you enter in this box. So you'll enter your email address, and you will repeat it to confirm the email address. And then the next section on the screen is the application validation. So that's the CAPTCHA screen, um, or CAPTCHA section. And you'll see some numbers entered on, this, on the CAPTCHA section. In this example, it's 2018. And you will type that number into the text box. If you can't see the number clearly, you can refresh the image until you see one that you can actually make out. So you can just click the CAPTCHA Recycle um, button here, and it will. you just keep clicking that until you see one that you can make out, and then enter the text in that field. Once you're happy that you've entered all the information correctly, you can click the Submit button, and that will bring you to the next stage of the um, registration process. So once you click Submit, you will receive a confirmation message, and that basically tells you that you have submitted your email verification, and an email will be sent to you um, with additional information. On this screen underneath, you see an example of the email. The email will come from curesregistration at doj.ca.gov, so you'll want to make sure that email address is listed in your safe senders list within the email application that you use. Um, if it's not, it may end up in your junk email folder. So if you don't receive an email, you can check your junk email folder to make sure it hasn't ended up in there. And if it has, then just add cures registration at doj.ca.gov to your safe senders list. Now the email will provide a link um, with with, when you click this link, it will bring you to the next stage of the registration process. So the next stage of the registration process is the registration page. And as you can see, it's quite a long, detailed page, but when we're going through um, this walkthrough, we'll split it up into two sections. You have the Applications Instructions section and then the Security Information section, the Security Questions section. We'll start off with the applicant information section. Once again, like all the other pages in the registration process, there's the instructions section at the top of the page, and then followed by the information that you're being requested. Um, the, on this particular section of the page, we're entering the applicant, applicant information. So you enter your first name, your last name, your title, your date of birth, you click social security number or your individual tax identification number. And it's important to note here that the information that you enter in the applicant information section should match what the ECA has on record for you. You should make those match. Then you select, oh, select your licensing board um, and your license type. And then you'll enter your state license ID, you re-enter your state license ID, and then your DEA number. Then we'll go to the next part of the registration page, and this is the security question section. Whenever you're um, going through registration, you'll be asked for five security questions and two help desk questions. 
The security questions are important because you will be asked those if those are for the self-help, self-service um, process. So if you forget your username or you forget your uh, password, you will be presented with one of the five security questions. Um, and it's, so it's important for you to remember the questions that you pick and the answers that you give because you will be prompted for those answers whenever you are using the self-service um, portion of the application. The help desk questions, there for um, if you need to reach out to our help desk and talk to them in person, then you will be asked, the help desk will ask you um, your two security questions to make sure you are the, who you say you are. So again, at the top of this page, you'll see the applicant's in, the instruction section. Um, this will give you information, more detailed information about the type of answers are, that are permitted in the security questions answer box. So for example, if the question is, what is the name of your first childhood pet? Um, you can't put the word pet as your answer because the answer cannot contain um, any of the words that are in the actual security question. So if you pay attention to the instructions at the top of the page when you're answering your security questions, and you make sure that you remember the security questions and your answers, um, then you'll be good to go. And then at the very bottom of the page, again, there's another CAPTCHA. You uh, enter the numbers that you see in the CAPTCHA box. And if you can't see the image clearly, then you can click refresh. Once you're happy with your security questions and your applicant information, you can click the button at the bottom to proceed to the next screen. So the next part of the registration process is the user registration form review. This gives you an opportunity to verify the information that you've provided. And if you need to make any changes, you have the option at the bottom of the screen to click the back button. And that will allow you to update your information. For example, if you made a typo in your um, DEA number, for example, you can go ahead and click the back button and make the correction. So once you've verified that all the information is correct and that it matches what DCA has on file for you, then you would read the terms and conditions. And if you agree to the terms and conditions, you click the checkbox at the bottom of the screen, and then click the Submit button to proceed to the next stage of the registration. So this brings you to the user registration confirmation page. It's important to note at this point, your application has not been approved. You just, we just have received your request for an, app, for an account. So what will happen in this screen is you will be presented with um, a confirmation number. We recommend that you print this number and keep it for your records. If you have any issues with your application, it will be helpful for our help desk to, for you to be able to quote that number um, so that we can help troubleshoot your application if there are any issues. Whenever you click, um, when you receive this user confirmation page, an email will be sent to you, an approval or a denial notification will be sent to you via email within 24 to 48 hours. So once again, it's important for you to make sure that your, uh, the email address that's coming from us is marked in your safe senders list. And if you don't see the email, you can check your junk email to make sure that it hasn't ended up in there, but you should receive an email from us within 24 to 48 hours. And this is an example of what the, the email the approved for an approved applicant um, looks like. So it will be sent with an email, and in that in email you will have um, you will be provided with your user ID. So this is the, the user ID, the account name that you will use to log on to the Cure system. Um, the very first time, uh, w the very first email, this approval email that you receive, um, for security purposes, we need to walk you through a few more um, security challenge questions before we give you your temporary password. So there will be a link in the email um, 
when you click that link, it will take you again to the next step in the, to complete your registration process in the profile. So the, the page that it will bring you to, it will ask you for your user ID, and that's the user ID that you received in the email. And then it will ask you three of your five security questions. So again, this is important. Um, it's important for you to have remembered what you entered in in the as part of the registration process, um, because you'll be asked them before you can actually receive even a temporary uh, password. Okay. So once you enter or answer the security questions correctly, you click OK, and then you receive another email, and the, e the email, this email will contain your temporary password and a link to the Cures 2.0 login. When you click the link, so you'll get the temporary password, you click the link to the two, Cures 2.0 login, and you're presented with the login page. And this is the login page that you'll use from moving forward using the application. This is the Cures 2.0 login page. So you enter your username, you enter your temporary password, and there's just a few more steps before you're actually a completed user. It's, it's just a few more. <laughs> okay, so upon the very first time you log in with your temporary password, you are prompted to reset your password. So you'll see the a password reset and confirmation page, um, or confirmation text box. And then again, there's that CAPTCHA coming up um, and you just enter the, the numbers you see. And if you don't see, if you're having trouble again reading it, you just keep clicking refresh until you see one that works for you. Okay, and then the very final step is for you to complete your user profile. So there's some information in the user profile um, section of Cures 2.0 information that um, wasn't asked in the, in the app as part of the registration process such as your address um, and that type of information. So you just complete that information, fill out that information in your user profile, including your address. Um, to edit the address section, uh, some of our users are having trouble with this, but there's a little pencil icon, and if you click it, it'll, um, and it'll allow you to enter text into, this, into the rows in the address section. Um, and it'll, if you want to save it, a checkbox, well, this pencil will change to a checkbox, and you just click the checkbox, and that will save your changes. And, and if you've made a, a mistake, you can just go ahead and edit it again by press, clicking the pencil. Okay, so once you've got that done, then you're officially an approved applicant and you're registered for Cures. So with that, I'm going to hand you back to Austin, and he can finish the um, slide deck. Thanks so much. So I'm going to briefly introduce you to the Cures platform now that you're a registered user. And keep in mind these new Cures 2.0 features are, are only things you're going to see if you're logged in using a contemporary browser and therefore on the Cures 2.0 site uh, as opposed to the 1.0 site, which again you'll be directed to if you have an older browser. So some of the new Cures 2.0 features include delegation authority, and this is where prescribers and dispensers can assign delegates who can then initiate Cures uh, PAR, patient activities, on their behalf. There's also compact flagging, and this is where prescribers can note, note their patients with whom they have treatment exclusivity agreements. Uh, this is something you might see an addiction medicine specialist, where if you have an agreement with someone that they'll only, a patient will only receive opioids from you, for example, and they can note that so that when, uh, when folks look them up, that patient up in the system, they'll see that such an agreement is in place. Peer, -peer, uh, peer communication is where prescribers and dispensers in the new system can instigate messages to fellow prescribers about mutual patients of concerns. And then we'll have uh, patient safety alerts last. This is information regarding patients who reach various prescribing thresholds, and I'm going to go through each of those messages, those alerts right now. So there's five of the alerts, and here are the alerts that the prescribers have received. So a list of the prescribers' patient, patients who receive or currently prescribe more than 100 morphine milligram equivalency per day, a list of the prescribers' patients who have obtained prescriptions from six or more prescribers or six or more pharmacies during the last six months, a list of the prescribers' patients who are currently prescribed more than 40 MMEs of methadone daily, 
lists of the prescribers' patients who are currently prescribed opioids for more than 90 consecutive days, and lastly, a list of the prescribers' patients who are currently prescribed both benzodiazepines and opioids. So this is the Cures 2.0 login page, and it can be accessed either through the Cures web page or using the link you see on the screen, which is https colon forward slash forward slash cures.doj.ca.gov. You also see at the bottom of the login image, uh, forgot password and forgot, you, you forgot your ID. Those are ways from, without, uh, from outside of the system. If you've forgotten those, you can retrieve those. We'll talk about more of those later. So the dashboard is the homepage for Cures 2.0. You can see at the top, maybe you can see, there's a navigation menu with home, user profile, PAR, and prescription form theft or loss. The sections of this page include favorites, and this is where you can set uh, patient searches that you run to be favorites that will appear on the screen. These may be people you, you search frequently, and you'll see there you can just click run. This is also where it delegates uh, initiate a patient activity report for you. That will appear here under the favorite section, and you'll just select run to go ahead and run that report. Below that, you'll see the patient alerts. You'll see there's, there's five black keys right here. If you hover over one of those, it'll show you the text of what that corresponding alert is, such that in the box below where you see, you're going to see rows of patient names and patient dates of birth, to the left of which are numbers, you'll know what the substance of those alerts are. When you see a one, you can hover over the one you see that. And so you'll know what the, what the issue is that's being raised. There's also a magnifying glass to the left of those numbers, and if you click on that, it'll show you a, a, in the text of what the alert is specifically. Prescriber messaging below, that's going to be where you might receive messages from prescribers and dispensers about a patient of mutual concern we discussed earlier. Bulletin advisories, those are just be in, uh, communications from the Department of Justice to the users. So this is a navigation menu just to give you an overview of what's in the, on the platform here. You see our user profile, you can, you can access the profile, manage delegates, and change password. One of the concepts is to have greater ability for the users to manage their own account here. And so they, you'll see you can go to profile, you can update things, things that you can't do in the current system and for which you need to reach out to us to have handled. Under PAR, you see patient activity report and manage safe searches, and we'll touch upon both of those. On the far right, you do see help, links, and logout. Uh, help, that, if you click on that, you'll receive a very useful document uh, that will provide more information about each of these issues. So let's go through uh, running a patient activity report, which will be what you do most of on this, uh, on this database. So you can run a patient activity report. You can initiate one one of two ways from the navigation menu at the top. You can click patient activity report, or down below in favorites, you can, you can click on create a new patient activity report. The next page, the search page, will appear here. And here you have to enter a first or a last name. I, I'd suggest certainly la entering a last name. Whether you want to enter a first name, I guess, may depend upon whether it's a name, say Jennifer, that might be Jen, Jenny, some variation where you think it might be too narrow for search. And then you've got to also enter a date of birth. The rest of the fields are optional, um, but you can enter them if you want to help narrow the search down. Down below, you'll see under search by time, there's a time period in terms of months, which I believe is set to default six months. You can, you can change that. You can search uh, as far back as 12 months from the current date. You can also select date range uh, if you want to search, say, January 1st to March 31st for some reason. You can go ahead and identify those specific dates to search. Then you'll click search, and you'll get the results table page. Now, you'll see at the top there's going to be a search criteria that's just going to indicate to you uh, what search criteria you entered in. If you think you've made a mistake or if you realize looking at the results table that it's just a broader search than you want, you're, you're capturing people other than your patient, then you can hit the revise search button, go back, and you can, uh, you can refine your search. There's also a save search button, which we'll touch upon later. But just note that if you hit save search right there, it's going to save your search criteria for, for, for further use and it's a pop-up box will come up where you can title that search. So below in the results table, what you're going to see here is, is a number of uh, results. And this system, we don't have a unique identifier reported to us, like Social Security number. The statute doesn't provide for that as a mandatory reporting item. And so the system really doesn't know um, if John Smith and Marina Del Rey of a birth date of 1-175 is the same John Smith 
with the same birth date in Downeyville. And so what you're going to see if you enter search criteria that would cover both of those individuals, in other words, you don't put a, an address or a city in, they'll both appear in the, in the results table there, and each of them will be in a different row. And this is, the, this is the instance where the user has to use a little bit of their judgment here to determine which of the records coming back reflect the patient that they're interested in here. Um, sometimes it'll be, like I said, they're in cities in different areas of the, of the state. Uh, other times it'll be something simple, like you'll see uh, this, this someone, a dispenser entered in an apartment number and, a, and another dispenser didn't enter an apartment number, but to the system they look like different, uh, different entities. So those are pretty easy. There is a button up top, at the top here. If, if you want all of them, as you scroll through and look at them, you just click that and it'll highlight all of them. Or you can click, uh, you can click specific rows so that you're comfortable that the person that you're looking at, the records that you're looking at are all associated with the patient you want. This is actually a pretty quick process once you've done it a few times. Then you click the View Details button at the bottom. This is the View Details page here. And there's a carousel feature at the top right here. And what you're going to see is for each row you selected saying these records I believe are associated with this patient, you're going to see a, a new, a different uh, box there. So you'll see result one will be one of the rows, result two will be a different one of the rows. The numbers up here you'll see for the name, address, if you put that in, date of birth, uh, for, the, for that data, the records will correspond with the number down here, result number. So these will be associated with, with this patient entity. Um, what you see here is you can see a number of rows here. We'll discuss what's in the patient activity report in a minute. Uh, and you see this link right here, view prescriber contact. If you click on that, it'll take you up to the contact and messaging features we'll, we'll talk about in a moment. If you click the print PAR button down here, you're going to see the standard PDF PAR, button, PAR that, you're, uh, that you're used to seeing. Uh, one of the features some folks asked for was also to have an Excel version. And so we've now made that available to the download PAR button to the left. And that Excel feature also, the, the Excel spreadsheet also has a few additional fields that the, that the PDF print PAR doesn't. So these are the fields you'll see in the patient activity report. If you see an asterisk next to it, it means it's going to appear in the Excel uh, spreadsheet, but wouldn't appear in the PDF PAR. So you see date filled, date sold, drug name, form, drug strength, quantity. You see the patient's name, date of birth, address, and gender, the pharmacy name and license number, and doctor's name and DEA number. You'll see a payment method, prescription number, refill number, recalls authorized, and a species code. So as discussed, if you click on that view prescriber contact under the carousel, it's going to take you over to the contact and messaging tab. And take a note here, this tab feature, as you work your way through each of these tabs, rather than having to hit a back button or worse yet, sometimes going up to your browser's back button, at which point you get timed out or kicked out of the application for some, uh, for some software um, platform, this one has a tab feature, so you can actually just tab back and make changes and then proceed back to the process. So you'll find it relatively convenient to do that. So once you click that link for contacts and messaging or for, for view prescriber contact, you're going to get on the contacts and messaging screen. And think of these as essentially discrete functions or, or features. The patient details here at the top, this is going to be the contacts. Now you can either, doing this, see what the compact is, with whom does the person have a compact, is there a compact, or very simply you can set a compact if this is a patient that you want to set one with, and you'll just click that box there and you'll set a compact. Down below on that same page, this is the messaging function. What you're going to see here is uh, for that carousel entity you clicked on, these are all the prescribers who are prescribing to that individual. They're mul often multiple. If these prescribers are all logged into the Cure, all members are they've registered for Cure's access, excuse me, you'll see an email address and a phone number here. And you can do one of two things. You can either send a message to all of them using the message detection right here and just enter a message and send that message. It'll go to all of them. Or you can just pull the information from right here and contact one of the prescribers if you don't want to send a message to all of them at the same time. We talked about the save search feature. Again, you click on this, you're going to save the search criteria, you're going to title the search, and you'll have a save search. I'll show you in the next page where you'll find those. So under PAR, if you click on Manage Save Searches, right here, you'll get this page. And this will be a table showing all of your titled save searches right there. If you click on one of them, you'll get the query details here, and you can go ahead and load the search, uh, or delete the search if you'd rather, 
or you'll see a button right here that says favorite. If you change, if you click a button there to change favorite from no to yes, it'll appear on your home, your dashboard, which I showed you earlier, there's a favorite section. And so that's how you get a, a save search to appear there. Moving to the profile now, if you click profile from the user drop down menu, you'll see that your profile has a accordion, essentially accordion layout here. You can open up each of these, name and ID, address, DEA, email address, or delegations, and click edit to those. And if it's something that can be edited, you'll see it pop up in a text field you can make those changes. So if you want to change your email address now, you can do that. If you want to add a DEA number, change an address, any of those things that you still have to contact our program for, you, you can do those now. You can expand all of them here, like I said, or only one at a time. Delegates. To get the delegates, you'll go to user profile, click on manage delegates. And on this page, you'll see your delegates. Um, you can go ahead and delete that delegate if you want from this page under action over here. But an easy way to add them is you click this add tab, and then it'll bring up this page. And you'll just all you have to do is enter the, the delegate's first name, last name, email address, and re-enter it there. Uh, and click the certify and, and hit add. And it'll send an email to the delegate, that email address, that'll show them how to set up their account. So a few final notes. Password resets for security purposes are required every 90 days. The system won't lock you from, from getting in if it's an expired password. Essentially what it'll do is it'll force you into a password change once you log in if your password's expired. As we discussed before, if you're outside of the system, you can't remember your password, then you can use the forgot password process. It's going to ask you for your user ID. It'll ask you to answer a couple of your security questions, and then you'll get a temporary password. If you forgot your user ID, you'll click this button right here below it, and it will ask you for your email address, and it'll send you your user ID. Additional resources. On the next page, I'll show you some links that will get you to these things, but we have a user guide. We discussed that on the help link. Um, but also we have training videos, and those are available on our website, and they go into, I think, even more detail than we've gone into here, um, and they'll be quite helpful, and they're focused on specific aspects, so you don't have to watch an entire long video about the whole application. You can focus in on that issue of which uh, you're interested in. So here are those links, the Cures 2.0 homepage. The Cures 2.0 training videos are on the homepage under Publications. And there's our Cheers 2.0 registration URL. Here's, of course, the email to contact us if you have any questions, cures at doj.ca.gov, and our address there, and again, the website to get to our homepage. I'm going to leave the last screen up here, which has the links on it, and I'm going to pass it back over to CDA. I understand they have some questions for us. Hi, everyone. Thank you all for your patience, and sorry about the start with the audio there. Um, we see some questions coming in, and um, I will see if I can read the ones that are kind of created as a theme instead of going down every question that we're getting. Um, one question we're seeing is, do I receive a confirmation, and if so, how long should I expect it to take? The confirmation you're going to get is, is that you have applied is really just the page that Hemer showed early on. After you've submitted the application, you're going to review it. You're going to then hit sort of submit, and you'll get a confirmation pop-up. And you should print that page if you want something showing that you've applied. Again, that doesn't show that you've been approved, but that you've applied. Beyond that, there's really no separate email that's going to confirm that you've applied. You're just going to, within, well, within 48 to 72 hours, receive an email notifying you whether or not you've been approved or denied. So that's the information you're going to get about your status. It's not much of a long wait, and you'll find out relatively quickly whether or not you've been approved or denied. Okay, and another question that comes in is, do we have to look up every patient before writing a prescription? No. The, what's required by the statutes enabling our program is that you register. Whether or not you feel it's appropriate to use in your practice um, is something we leave to your medical judgment. Okay, and for those who have registered previously with Cures 1.0, do they need to register again? No, they don't. Their accounts will be automatically, or have been automatically migrated over to Cures 2.0. And, and they will have to go through an updating of their profile the first time they log in and setting a few things up but they do not have to go through the registration process that Emer just went through. Thanks. Um, 
Do I have to report every opioid or controlled substance that I prescribe? When you're prescribing a controlled substance, you don't report it. It's the dispenser that reports it. So unless, unless you are actually direct, directly dispensing them, the, the controlled substances, um, you really don't have to do any reporting to Cures. Is registering for Cures 2.0 mandatory, and what happens if I don't do it or don't do it by the July 1 deadline? If you're licensed in California and you have a DEA registration certificate that authorizes you to prescri prescribe controlled substances in California, it is required. Um, again, our enabling statutes don't speak to the consequences for failing to register, so that's an issue that really the, the regulatory boards will have to determine what, if any, consequences are appropriate for failure to comply with the statutory mandate. Yeah. Um, does each provider within a practice need to apply for their own CURES account? Yes. If, again, if, they're, if they have a, a, a license in California and they're authorized to prescribe controlled substances, uh, then they have to they have to prescribe. You wouldn't you wouldn't um, register for cures as a uh, as a medical group, for example, or as a dental group. Each individual person who would qualify would have to register. Um, is there a way to verify that I've completed everything? I have registered, but I don't know if anything else is needed. Well, if you've if you've made it through the registration process, then at least it means you've entered the required fields. You'd be blocked from proceeding through that process if you didn't enter the required fields. So you've entered some information. You've seemingly entered all the information we would need to make a determination about your application. But in terms of whether or not you're going to be approved or denied, you really would have to wait for the 48 to 72 hours to see what the determination is. And if you're denied at that point, you know you can reach out to us and we can help troubleshoot that issue with you. Okay. Um, do we have any other questions? One more. What should dentists do if a patient requests a copy of their CARES report? Well, my suggestion would be that they, there's a way they can get it, and that's by contacting us directly. And we can, through a, through a mechanism, make their records available to them directly. We, we wouldn't recommend that the, that, the, your, um, that the dentist provide copies, hard copies to the patients for a couple reasons. One, if they've run too broadly of a search, they risk handing over records that maybe go beyond that patient and may include other patients as well. And the other issue is when they hand that over to the individual, it's going to have that dentist's name on the report. And so th there is a risk later on if, if a patient comes back and says, this, this, this dentist provided my confidential medical information to another person. Um, it's going to be tough for the dentist to show a, a chain of custody once that's left his or her hands. So our suggestion, again, is if they want a copy of it, come to us directly and have them request it through us and receive it that way. And Mike may want to add to that. Oh, he simply, he's welcome to talk to the patient about his report on screen and show him the report on screen. Right, right. Uh, yeah, that's not. So if the, if the dentist wants to talk about the report with the patient and then show, even show what's on screen there, um, we don't see a real problem with that, but we would advise against handing uh, the paper uh, printout of it to the patient to take with him or her. We have one more that comes in saying, my browser is updated and I finished the first step of the registration process. After that, the link that I received from DOJ didn't work. What should I do next or who should I contact? So let me, there's a couple possibilities I can imagine in that scenario with the information provided. One, it, it, based on what you're saying, it could be a couple things. So one, it could be that the link's just not a link, it's, it's just plain text that would actually need to be physically copied and put into the browser uh, address field to get it to go there. It's in other words, it's not an active link that you can just click upon. The other would be sometimes you have an, you have a contemporary or an updated browser, but you also have an outdated one. You may have IE10 and also Firefox, and you may have IE10 be your default browser. So if you click on the link, it's going to direct you to your default browser, which wouldn't be compatible for the registration process. So that's another reason to make, to copy and paste that link, and then open up the the compliant browser and then paste it in there. Another possibility is if a person's already gone through the process and applied and been denied, they may go back to that same link. The link's only going to be good for a single application. So if they've already gone through that application process, they really need to start from the beginning, not go back and use what is a stale link. 
And the last thing is occasionally some people will take that link and just copy and paste it into the Google search browser, and that won't give them what they're looking for. That's good. They're going to look for that exact URL, and it's going to give them uh, it's going to give them a message that it's not found. So make sure they're putting it actually in the web address field at the top of the browser, not plugging it into like a Google search field. I think that's it for our questions. Um, thank you all for taking the time to participate today. We hope that it will be helpful in getting you registered. A quick reminder that if you have any other questions or need assistance registering, you can contact DOJ at the number and email address that was on the previous screen. If you didn't catch that, it was 916-227-3843, 916-227-3843. Yeah.